Lisa, and I'm here with Ross, Khadija Two, or Khadija, and we are the Academy of Broadcasting Interns Group Two. Today, we'll be talking about the impact of music on youth in the way they behave, interact, and even dress. Some might even ask us how we feel about it today. Just like Anissa said, we are talking about music. You are listening to WBPG LP 102.9 FM radio. The top 10 genres that youth listen to is hip hop slash rap, techno, R&B, punk, alternative rock, house, country, indie rock, electro, and Latin. The, PP, PR, the PPL PRS United for Music says that music has a mental and physical impact on your body. While most people listen to music for entertainment, you should also know that it can help boost your overall well-being. From reducing stress and improving cognitive performance to encouraging and inspiring creativity, the power of music is truly amazing. It won't be a surprise to most that music can affect the human brain emotionally. We all have that one song that brings us to tears, at the same time have a song that can really pump us up and get us going. Music can have a massive effect on emotions, and that's one of the reasons why composers add music to films. They want us to feel happy, sad, angry, scared at exactly the right time. And thebrainfit.com also says playing or even just listening to music can make you smarter, happier, healthier, and more productive at all stages of life. The John Hopkins Medicine researchers also say pay attention to how you react to different forms of music and pick and to be to know which ones you really work with because some music that helps other people concentrate might be distracting to someone else and what helps one person unwind might make somebody else jumpy and teenagers today can really be emotional. Some teenagers use music today to channel their, mu- to their feelings or use music to help them get over their emotions they are currently feeling. With that being said, we did want to lighten the mood, but Ross... Man, go ahead and say y'all jokes, man. <laughs> so, Khadija 2 and I have a couple of jokes to lighten the mood. So, who is 6 ix half-brother? I don't know. Who is 6 ix half-brother? <laughs> <laughs> Three, four, five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go, go. What is Beethoven doing right now? I don't know. What's he doing? <laughs> He's decomposing. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> what a knee slapper. Okay, <laughs> anyway. So, <laughs> fashion in common with music says more about our culture than we give it credit for. Since the 1920s with the jazz and women wearing loose flapper dresses to the present with rap and youth wearing tight jeans while sagging their pants with belts. Also, sagging started in the U.S. prisons in the 1960s as a result of restrictions being placed on belts and um, shoestrings to, because inmates would use them to commit suicide or inflict harm on other inmates or guards. That is why some of the older generation is upset with this trend, with this trend, but we can tell by the bell-bottom jeans worn by hippies in 1969 and the tight skinny jeans worn by emos in 2005 that music has impacted fashion. But hip-hop has also impacted fashion in the 1980s which slowly evolved from the 1990s. The hip-hop community started getting influenced by traditional African-American dressing, bright colors, large pants, and and headwear were the elements which inspired the style of dressing in the early 1990s. Music and fashion became associated because they allowed you to freely express political beliefs like individuality and sexuality, and music can also influence mood and emotion. For that exact reason, it is used in fashion shows to set the tone and the mood based on clothing items. And before Ross goes, I have a question. What is one of y'all's favorite fashion trends? It's not really a fashion trend, but um, the artist Billie Eilish, she wears a lot of baggy baggy clothes, so she isn't judged for what she looks like underneath, and so she's not, so her body doesn't represent who she is as a person, which I really respect, and I also like baggy clothes a lot as well. So yeah, I agree with that. What about you? Yeah, yeah that have to be my favorite. Yeah. All right. Well, to tie into Anisha's point, um, 
a new branch of rap that has been forming since the early 2010s, drill music has played a part in fashion as well. Um, with the arise with the rise of uh, saggy pants and ski masks, drill is a branch of rap that can be compared to trap music. Both are about life in the streets, but while trap music is about the trap, hence the name, and the violence of the things, drill music is also about the violence, but with a more aggressive, dark, violent, and about violence in in the areas. Um, if someone says we are doing a drill, it means someone is going to get hurt. Um, these aggressive themes are evident in music videos. Um, drill rap originated in the south side of Chicago in the early 2010s and was made popular by rappers Chief Keef, Lil Reese, Lil Durk, and others with songs like So So. Y'all know that song, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what I don't like, New York is another drill hub in the U.S. Brooklyn, and U.K. drill emerged in the mid 2000s. Earlier, him and his crew were arrested on weapons and conspiracy charges in 2014. There are speculations that the lyrics from his song might be cited as evidence. Um, I can't say the lyrics on here, but it is pretty graphic. Um, the song was eventually not referenced to court, but still it played a big part because both Bobby and his friend still served more than six years in prison. So, which leads to my question for y'all. How do y'all feel on court using these lyrics in, in their cases for the rappers? You could go first. Um, before I answer the question, you're listening to WBPG LP 102.9 FM radio. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please call 617-282-0685. And my, like, my two cents on that is I don't really have an answer to that question because I feel like a lot of rappers or a lot of p artists use, like, they can say what they did, their crimes, in their music. So it's kind of hard to, like, kind of look away from that that makes sense okay so i've also seen about um there are labels that push rappers drill rappers um uh in general to talk about more of these lyrics because it feel it gives them controversial which gives them more ratings for people to look at their songs how do y'all feel about that mm, i feel like i don't know you could go first because i don't know <laughs> you, you answer the question Oh me? Yeah. yeah. Oh okay. Uh, I don't know. It's it's on both sides. You're gonna see a cause and effect. The cause is that you're going to see the rapper be in trouble, but you'll also see the rapper uh get more fame because people glorify this, which I don't agree with. But we have a question. We have a question here. Um, it is. Oh, we don't have a question. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> That's okay. fine. That's fine. Nah, I thought we had a question. Never mind. Yeah. But my question, I have a question for y'all. Um, now, here's the opposite. There are rappers pretending to do drill or pretending to be from what they're not. What do y'all feel about that? Um, I think it takes away from the people that actually have went through things and, you know, you know what they call it, making it out of the mud and, you know, <laughs> building themselves up and, you know, you know, kind of making themselves secure in life, and yeah. Yeah, um, I agree with you on that. I never went through that, so I couldn't really speak on it, but. And if it was like to happen to me, like if I was an artist and I went through something and I used my music to express that and somebody took my story or not copied me, but like acted as if they went through the same thing, that would make, that would like piss me off. That would make me mad. So like, what if, what if he like, like say if it was you like he copied your whole lifestyle like the way you get up the way you go to work every day how do you how you want to feel on type of way you feel some type of way oh yeah i would if you copying me but like if you're just speaking on something that you haven't done then what did that have to do with me huh interesting <laughs> yeah so um <laughs> A little light. How did? Who is y'all favorite drill rappers and why? And not why. What is y'all favorite songs from that rapper? Um, my favorite drill rapper was Pop Smoke before he passed. Um, and my favorite song of his is Dior. Okay. My fa I have two favorite drill rappers: Set the Trend and J Bucks. And my favorite song by them is EOS. All right. 
Uh, mine either has to be D thing or use G's. Um, I like his freestyle and yeah, I like his freestyle and use G's. I don't remember his song, but I just like like his music. So yeah, those so, are my questions. So I have a couple questions, and because we're ta- on the topic of drill, I'm gonna ask a drill question. And the reason why I'm asking these, this question is because um, a lot of youth in our generation, they listen to mostly drill music. So what do you think current hip hop like drill is doing to youth, like academically, emotionally? Like your friends listen to drill, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen like any effects on what drill has done to them? Because I know personally a couple people, you know, dropped out of school to do music. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. Um... It goes both ways. There are some people who, like, listen to it to get pumped up, which is the main reason I listen to it, um, which is the main reason I listen to it because it just gets me in a mood where I feel hyped. I don't feel sad. Like, in the moment, it feels good. But when you go, when you listen to the lyrics, it's pretty bad, which is the reason why Mm -hmm. most adults have problems with this type of genre. I think sometimes, like, it can influence the youth to try and do the stuff in the songs. Like, if... I'm not going to say that, but, like, it could just, like, make them want to do that type of stuff that they do in songs. Other than, the, like, the negative part about, like, the lyrics and stuff like that, um, drill can also be something, a way to, like, to pump yourself up, yeah. like, at parties. You know, you, like you said, dancing and stuff like that. There's yeah. dancing within drill. So, you know, I think that's a positive outlook on it. So, yeah. yeah. Another question... Hold up, hold up. Before you go, I have a drill question, too, before we get off the topic of drill. Okay. If drill music is, like, so bad to the youth, then why is everyone allegedly fine or, like, okay? So, it plays back to what um, uh, my fellow AOB member Angelica said. People were saying that in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, to the 2000s. Now they're saying it in the 2010s. Um, it's definitely people not getting used to uh, somebody's music preference pro- yeah i feel yeah. like music is progressing right and like the older well, i don't gener- know about progressing like it's changing <laughs> drill is yeah, new yeah it's changing drill it's changing. is new so yeah. that's what i mean by progressing yeah so with the changing i think the older generation is not like used to this type of music right so yeah, yeah it's all about it's all about that it was it's been going on for years and years and years yeah. decades decades centuries centuries it's all about yeah we're, I'm not, I don't know the future, but mm-hmm. in the 2000s, they turned out pretty much fine. Not 100%, but they yeah. were fine. So, yeah, that's, it's just preference. That's all it is. Okay, so is that all the questions about Joe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 other than jail rappers, what is your favorite artist? Like, that can be, you know, that does somebody that does R&B or jazz? All right. My, you no, want no, to go? go ahead, go ahead. Right. Mine would have to be um Bryson Tiller. Mm-hmm. I, I like him. Um, mine is Drake. He is just overall like a very diverse artist. Like he goes through his phases, which is kind of annoying. But <laughs> when he's a rapper, yeah. And I also like Kendrick Lamar because he stays in his own bubble. Um, yeah, he's very like yeah clean yeah. like if you go and check his like everything is you can't really find nothing wrong with him right. he don't he don't follow the trains of everybody else yeah right. yeah he do his right. own stuff he knows his identity and make that yeah. sense yeah. Yeah. yeah like and even if he didn't post a song for four years and then when it when he finally did drop a whole album it felt like he put a lot of effort to it yeah so yeah that's why i like him um so i don't know if it's really considered a drill rapper but not drill, but, you know, rap, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rod Wave, kind of like Drake, he also does different things. Mm-hmm. So that's why I also like him. What did you call him? A me- melodic rapper? Oh, he's a uh, melodic. A, mele- a melodic <laughs> rapper. I don't, I've never yeah. heard of that a damn moment. A life. melodic. Like, like, it's melody and melodic. Like. Okay, I guess. <laughs> like, you say real and you say realistic. It's melody and melodic. Okay, like um, so the you said you guys your favorite rap um, artist, right? Yeah. So when you listen to these artists, how do they make you feel? <laughs> Yo, you you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bryson Tiller. Well, it depends what song. Like mm-hmm. sometimes it makes me like you know hype, and then sometimes it makes me want to cry and slide down a wall, and yeah. Yeah. 
And again, this is WPPG LP 102.9 FM Radio. If you have any questions or comments, please call us at 617-282-0685. That again is 617-282-0685. Yeah. Um, uh, good job with that. That was, that was clean. That was clean. <laughs> but uh, my the way Drake makes me feel is... Man, Drake's me Drake makes me want to open up a bank account. <laughs> like he want he makes me he makes me want to invest in some like in some Apple or something. He makes me want to like put a down payment on something. I don't, I don't even know what that is, but Drake's makes me feel like that. <laughs> but, nah, but but for real, uh Drake Drake makes me feel like however I'm feeling. If he makes a rap song, he makes me hype a little bit. If he like makes a chill little song, I'll be chill or like the only thing I don't like about Drake is his pop phase, which is his like lover boy phase. I don't nah, like that. Nah, his pop phase was good. Okay, I see we got different <laughs> opinions on nah. that. Nah, because when you like when you really just in the mood to just sing, mm-hmm. you turn on a Drake song. Mm-hmm. See, the problem is I can't sing, so like that's <laughs> well, that true. sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, like I said, that um, music can affect people emotionally. So I feel like Rod Wave, mm. um, he kind of, a lot of people go through stuff. Like, everybody has their own journey. Everybody has their own experiences. So, and um, Rod Wave isn't so, like, um, general. Like, it's not it's not specific at all. It's general, and it's more, like, you can still sing to it, even if you've gone through different things. Like, you, my experience and your experience are different, right? Mm-hmm. But we can both vibe and listen to Rod Wave and still connect to what he's saying in his lyrics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is why I like him a lot. Yeah. Saying, yeah, Drake, universally loved. <laughs> he's yeah. universally loved. You said, yeah. You said you liked his Arabic song that he... Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, he's so diverse. Mm-hmm. He's so diverse. Let me not make this a Drake podcast, but, <laughs> but he's so diverse, man. Like, makes you want to go check check in. Uh, go give your check to the bank. Makes you want to. Makes you want to withdraw some money. Yeah, from the bank. yeah. It makes you. Yeah, it makes you want to pay rent or something. Yeah, or pay a bill. Okay. <laughs> other than hip hop. <laughs> okay. Other than hip hop and rap, what other genres of music do you like? You can go. Lady stories. <laughs> um, I like R and B, and yeah, I like R and B. Yeah, yeah, I'll go R and B too. I feel like everybody likes R and B. It's either R and B, blues, and jazz. Yeah, I feel like those are really good. And house, I love me some house. See, oh, I didn't yeah. even see. See, <laughs> see that's see. where I wanted to get you. I didn't even know Ooh. house was a whole genre of music. For real, I wasn't introduced to house until like we started up this whole thing. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't know what house. No, nah, I'm just saying I don't like house. Yeah, <laughs> girl, don't do that. <laughs> okay. So, do you have any questions, Lisa? Um, I actually I do revolving around fashion. So, like I said earlier, what is one of y'all favorite fashion trends? But what is one of y'all least favorite fashion trends? Oh my gosh, bro! <laughs> if I see you, this is this is just me, okay? If I see you wearing Yeezy boots, I'm I'm running I'm running the other way, cause. They're like astronaut boots. I don't. I personally don't like it. I know some people who have them. I feel like because of the price, everybody want like people would get it because it's famous and because Kanye. Yeah, made it. Uh, the artist Kanye. Yeah, but like the song Kanye is crazy. I don't. I don't understand why people. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> their personal um, preference. Like you said, um, you said that um, people would sag their pants because they were incarcerated right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i feel like I, I don't like that i don't like that like the sagging of pants i don't like it or ski mask i feel like a lot of people or those ski- astronaut boots yeah or <laughs> <laughs> the ski mask that people wear because of rappers or an artist who wear them i don't like it especially because it's summer it's summer and why are you wearing a ski mask i feel like i would understand if it was winter because y- your face gets cold i guess but it's summer. It's like ninety degree weather. Why are you wearing a ski mask? It's not making sense. My mm-hmm. least favorite gotta be the creased Air Forces, like <laughs> black Air Forces, and then calling it a menace society. Mm-hmm. I feel like, well, yeah, you are a menace society, but okay. So we have ten minutes left, and we also have a comment. Oh, okay. Do any of you follow these artists on social media, and do you feel they are authentic, meaning their public life matches their private life? 
Um, <clears throat> with the artist, uh, Kendrick Lamar, definitely. Um, the fact that he has one social media in his Twitter, and he didn't post anything for around three years, it, that, that, like, that makes me feel yeah. I should keep private, but at the same time show what I actually do. He shows, like, him going to Africa, him feeding the poor, him making music. It's just him, him being him. I don't like... In my opinion, I don't like artists who, like, post their cars or, like, post post all their money and stuff. Kind of like flex. Yeah, kind of yeah. like that either. Flex on you. It shows, like, a le- like a fake life a little bit. Right. I a like, fake life. Yeah, I like people who just show what they do. I I'm not saying put all your problems out right, there. Right, right, right. But show that, you know, you're also a human being. Right. Yeah. Show what's real. Um, For me, yes, I also, I follow. Oh. You got a call. You got a you can continue. Yeah, you so you go. Yeah, you go. <laughs> All right. So, um, like you were saying, um, Kendrick, I like him. I follow him. Mm-hmm. But with any of the other rappers, I don't know. The Joe <laughs> yeah. rappers, on the other hand. Yeah. That's um, that's a whole different type of rap there. Yeah. I, like, I literally saw it the other day. I was scrolling through my Instagram. I don't I don't remember who it was. Hello? They posted a camel. Hi. Hi. You can ask your question. A camel? Yeah. All right, I'm but we have a question right here. Sorry. Go ahead. The Chicago area, and I want you're talking about fashion now, mm-hmm. and I wondered what you thought about Bruno Mars and the old style fashion that that group is bringing back. Uh, oh, I think can I answer this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. All right. All right. So basically, I'm kind of obsessed with like everything before my generation, like. I know, fashion. like the 80s and the 90s And the little stuff. disco yeah. balls and the afro. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. The ni- Okay, actually, in the uh, seventh grade, I wore my afro to school for, um, I forgot what it was for, but it was for a day that they had, mm-hmm. and I loved it. It was amazing. I liked it a lot. And, like, the Black Panther movement with their whole mm-hmm. attire, I feel like attire puts everything together, if that makes sense. Yeah. I so I like that. I like that. I like that, that they're bringing it back, too. Because it shows the new generation that there's different styles of fashion. And there was different styles of fashion before them. So, yeah. And the fashion has really evolved, like, so yeah, much. Yeah, it evol- evolved so much. Like, people, it, like, express themselves through their fashion and stuff like that. So. Yeah. And what about you, bro? Yeah, me personally, I'm, like, in all of 80s and 90s. Because I feel like that's when fashion itself, in my opinion, that's when it was starting to peak because everyone was trying out new things and Mm -hmm. the new things were pretty good and even to go even more back what you said about bruno mars i feel like that's how it is in in every generation people some people don't like the new type of fashion they like to go back and like reminisce or not even reminisce because they weren't there but like go back and just see what it was like like Mm -hmm. people wearing suits people wearing uh, you know the, the fanny packs, stuff? like yeah, the, the fanny, fanny packs, or like Crocs. Now I feel like Crocs was a, a yeah. old thing. Like yeah, back Crocs then. used to be clogs. They yeah, was I feel like if you wore Crocs before, like you would, yeah. you would be like not judged heavily, but like they would give you a side eye. But now it's coming back. Yeah. So yeah, I used to wear Crocs as a kid. I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't remember it clearly, but I remember having Crocs as a kid. Yeah. And so Crocs I, was out back then. Yeah. <laughs> So I yeah, too. Oh, I know, I know that. So yeah, I like the fact that they're bringing everything back. It's it's um not new, but the fact that they're bringing back is new. If that makes sense. Like the phrase "history repeats itself." Yeah, sometimes it can be positive, sometimes it can be negative. So thank you for calling and asking. Thank you for calling. Thank you so much. Anyways, we have a few minutes left. We have three minutes left, so we'll be wrapping up. Again, you are listening to WPPG LP 102.9 FM radio. If you have any questions, call us at 617-282-6085. Anything you guys want to say? No, I think that's it. So the next group will be coming back in a few minutes, talking about the history of education for African Americans in Massachusetts. So, yeah. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank y'all you. so much. Thank, Thank you for so listening. Much.
What's good, everybody? Welcome and thank you so much for tuning in to WBP WBPG LP 102.9 FM Boston Praise Radio. You are listening to the second live broadcast of the Academy of Broadcasting. We are so happy to be back with you all on this great day. Today we will be touching on the history of education for African Americans in Massachusetts. I am Brienne. My name is Cameron. And I'm Angelica. Within the next 30 minutes, we have split into t- three 10 minute sessions where three topics we have each researched within the history of education of students of color. These three will be the Boston busing crisis, the school to prison pipeline, and students of color in suburban schools. While we're discussing, please feel free to call in at 617-282-0685 or comment any questions into the chats. We'd love to have a conversation with everyone. Our first topic here will be on what is commonly known as the Boston busing crisis. In 1974, Boston public schools were required to integrate through new bus systems. Segregation was illegal in the city of Boston, but still very present. The Boston School Committee's districting policies led to segregation through underpaid and understaffed schools in the black communities. These schools received two thirds of the funding that white schools received. The 1965 Racial Imbalance Act stated any school with a student population where 50% of students or more are one race is considered segregated. And at the time, 44 Boston public schools fell under the definition of a segregated school. But the Boston School Committee refused to take action. So the African American parents decided to make a stand by organizing protests and they also opened freedom schools, which are meant to be more inclusive schools. In 1966, the Metropolitan Council of Education Opportunity, also known as METCO, was established. METCO allowed for African American students to have access to suburban schools. In 1972, the parents partnered with the NAACP to file a lawsuit against the Boston School Committee. This lawsuit was known as the Morgan v. Hennigan. In June 1974, the committee's refusal to integrate public schools was found unconstitutional. So a Boston, the busing plan was put in place under the oversight of George Wendell Garrity. Protests erupted in the summer of 1944, which was led by Louise Day Hicks chairwoman of the Boston School Committee. She also led the main anti-busing group named Restore Our Alienated Rights, also known as ROAR. ROAR led often violent protests, sit-ins, and prayer circles while they actively worked to intimidate intimidate black school children. Roar also organized a protest where thousands marched upon the Massachusetts State House to protest the desegregation of these schools. But in September 12th, on September 12th, 1974, the Boston busing began. Violence broke out and the National Guard had to come settle down the white mobs. In the 1974 to 75 school year, 18,000 students were bused, and 30,000 white students unenrolled from Boston public schools and enrolled in suburban private schools. This busing program lasted until 1988, but today, 70 of uh, 54% of Bostonians are white. 14% of them go to Boston public schools. And as of 2018, more than half of Boston public schools are categorized as segregated, which means in more than half of these schools, one race makes up more than half of the student population, 
which is more schools than were segregated in 1965. At many Boston schools today, 90% of all students enrolled are students of color. Again, you're listening to WBPG LP 102.9 FM Boston Praise Radio. We're currently discussing the history of education for African Americans in Massachusetts. Please call in at 617-282-0685 and use the chats for any questions or comments. Each of us have researched different topics about the umbrella under the umbrella of education for African Americans in this state. And we will we will be very happy to open the conversation um, both for questions and comments to all of you about the Boston busing crisis. So before I get my section started, I wanted to, Brianne, you were a Metco student, right? Or are? Yes, I was a Metco student. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Well, basically, I went on a bus every day, but I had to get up super early because school started around like 7.30. And so I had to get up around five so I could get on a bus every day with a bunch of other students who were also in the MECA program. And they would bring us to, there was different schools and they would each put us in one of the schools. And it was kind of, uh, at first it was pretty good because I started, I was one of the lucky people to be able to get placed in the MECA program in kindergarten. So I just grew up basically in it and then it started getting harder to be in the MECO program when I got older and I started to see the racism and started realizing what was actually going on in my school and the history itself being um, painted over and in history class so it was like but and that's why I'm not in the MECO program anymore but it was uh, definitely a good experience because I did get a better education than I would have if I went to Boston Public, but it was also a bad, uh, well, a hard experience. Um, so Brienne's section after me is going to be talking more about the experiences that students of color and face in predominantly white schools. But what I'm going to be talking about right now is the school to prison pipeline. And this is pertinent um, for students of color specifically because we are more targeted and we're must, much more likely to end up in that pipeline. So starting back in the 1800s where the first compulsory education law was passed here in this state. So what that, what that means is that it was mandated for students to either be in school or you, for them to have a job or otherwise they could be rounded up by truant officers or placed in reform schools. Um, And here is where we see the beginning of a lot of violence towards students from administrators and other authority figures because the punishments that misbehaving students were given were very, very physical, um, such as being able, such as having to hold out a heavy book with the arm straight out, um, being hit with the switch, or having a chip placed between their teeth so they couldn't talk. Um, flashing forward into the 90s is where we see the pipeline begin to form, uh, more concretely, that is. So with that, where the pipeline begins to form is we see the the start of zero tolerance policies being implemented in schools as well as school disturbance laws. And the idea behind it was that if students were punished for smaller Um, infractions earlier in life that it would stop them from being criminals later on because they saw the punishment that it would lead to but instead because it mandated expulsion and um and suspension for certain for certain infractions that it leads to students and ending up in the criminal justice system after leaving school so it targets students of disadvantaged backgrounds much more heavily because it furthers the racial profiling that we see already. And I'll explain as I go on um, how that plays out. So as I said, that these policies target students of color and low income students for poor behavior. Um, for one thing, the, the, the in offenses that these students are, more, are 
likely to be what's the word likely to be suspended for are much more subjective such as things like talking back to a teacher so we already know that black children get targeted for disciplinary action um much more disproportionately and much much younger as well um a big very big impact of that we can see um is after the columbine shooting so there's two things going on in that like columbine era which is the the fear of gun violence in schools particularly from students and the fear of gang violence at that time so this fear of gun violence led to students being criminalized already before even entering the school building because uh these students would be I'm sorry, uh, being criminalized before they went into the school building. And in schools, um, we see metal detectors and backpack searches as well as school police officers being um, implemented. And these policies are more heavily implemented at low-income schools with majority black and brown students. To As a little bit of a side note, these schools are already predominantly low income and the highest predictor of crime for a population is poverty. So you're when these policies are being implemented, you're already targeting a demographic that is more prone to to ending up in jail to begin with. So to also lead back to what I was saying originally, this fear of gun violence is also misplaced because at these schools, um, the demographic of students are some of the least likely to, to have access, not, not have access to guns, but to shoot up a school because predominantly the profile of a school shooter is a young white man when more heavily these um, young black men are being targeted. So um, in addition to this, like I said before, we have the fear of gang violence. And with this fear of gang violence, we see this term super predator tend to pop up. And it's another racist depiction of black people. And it's a more recent stereotype that came out of that era. So it comes out of the 80s with the crack baby stereotype and the welfare queen stereotype. And so essentially what the super predator is, is when that child grows up in that ghetto hood environment and ends up becoming gang affiliated and become and becoming more violent. So the issue with this is that during the time um, in the 90s and early 2000s is where juvenile crime rates had been plummeting for years and they have they've been going down since um, they're at some of the lowest that they've ever been. Um, but regardless of that, we still see young black children being targeted. So with these police officers that have been placed in schools, we see another phenomenon, which is um, students being attacked and arrested and harassed by these police officers. Uh, as a side note, um, this actually happened in a book I had to read last year for school, and it's called On the Come Up, where the whole catalyst of the event is the girl being like held down by the police officers at her school. And it's a real life thing, because we've all seen it happen. I'm sure we've all seen clips of kids on the news reporting that been, they've been arrested from school for, for being a child. Yeah. And a particularly egregious example of this is, um, six-year-old Kaya in 2019 she threw a tantrum like a six-year-old does and the school employees reported that she had kicked them and what the school responded with um was calling the police on this little girl and in the video you can hear the handcuffs being put on her you can hear her pleading them to get off of her and leave her alone and the video was taken by her grandmother and the only reason that the charges against her were dropped. She was charged with misdemeanor battery and they were dropped because the grandmother had sent the, the video into a local news station. And that's not the only example of this. Like I said before, you could, it would, it's not difficult to act, to look, go on YouTube and look up um, 
police attacking a student in school. It's not difficult, and there are news clips that will pop up. Uh, so another thing that what these school police officers do is they increase the amounts of violence that is not coming from students. All of these police officers do is further the racial profiling that already happens. And we can see this with black students being much more likely to be arrested in school as well and much more li much more likely to be suspended. Um so another study that was run on teachers actually to in this study they were seeing who the teachers were watching most closely and they were shown a video of four children and it was a black boy and a black girl and a white boy and a white girl and they were told to click on the sections of the screen where these children were uh, to watch for misbehavior where all the children were just like playing around the table uh, what the gag is is that none of these children were misbehaving and they, they were checking to see who the teachers were, mi were monitoring most heavily and who the teachers were monitoring most heavily was the little black boy. And when I say like little, I mean these kids are like six year olds, like max. So in summary, black students, um, black boys in particular are much more likely to be expelled. When students are expelled um, often, they're m expelled or suspended often they're much more likely to drop out. And without a high school diploma, they're much more prone to poverty and therefore crime, like I said earlier. Poverty is the biggest indicator of crime in a population. By criminalizing really, really young kids from the start with these stereotypes that are put onto them, put onto them as adults that are put onto these kids, it develops the mindset that um, consciously or subconsciously, that if they're only going to be viewed as a criminal, why should they try to be anything else? In addition to the factors that I've already mentioned before. Um, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you view that child as a criminal and you treat them as such, that that's what they're going to become eventually. And we know that th this this is, has been well documented and we know for a fact that the biggest population of, um, of inmates in the US are black people, black men specifically. And the, this pipeline is a large chunk of the reason for why that's the case. Um, that's the end of my segment and I'm gonna let Brienne explain hers. Uh, so real quick before we do, uh, again, you're tuning in to WBPG LP 102.9 FM Boston Praise Radio. Uh, we are currently discussing the uh, history of African Americans in Mass uh, education for African Americans in Massachusetts. And uh, please call in at 617-282-0685. Um, again, 617-282-0685. 0685 uh, we'd love to have this conversation with you well I will be talking about students of color in suburban schools and their experience currently the majority of Boston public schools and inner city schools are made up of students of color while the majority of suburban schools are made up of white students now these suburban schools where there's a bigger amount of white students um, they also receive more, a lot more funding and have way bigger budgets than Boston Public Schools. And to help their, um, help their kids, parents will try to put their students in better schools. So they'll try to put their kids, move the, their kids to these areas. But these areas are usually, these neighborhoods are very, usually very expensive. And so they'll put their kids in exam schools, Catholic schools, or programs like Mecca. MECO um, is a program that was established in 1966 to bus students of color to predominantly white schools where they could get a better education compared to inner city public schools. Now, MECO really helps a lot of students in many ways, and a lot of them get a really good education at these schools. 
but many students of color feel can may feel isolated and sense a lack of diversity at these schools. Now, um, MECO really is basically a program that is for and well, it's for just students of color. And this program is also very great because there's no other guidelines that say that talk about um, your economic status or anything to prevent you from being able to put in the being able to get in the program. So many people apply. Now, some people are lucky, like I was, and to get placed in the MECO program at a young enough age that they're able to just grow up in it and fit in automatically. While others are put in at an older age where they already basically got a feel of how things were going and already know what kind of is life like and so they have to basically start to fit in at this new place where there's a lack of diversity and and go from a place where there was um people a lot of diversity and people who looks like them to a place where they can't even connect with their teachers or their peers now because of this the students have to do something called identity switching which is basically where they have to switch their identity from one person to another. So in these suburban schools, they have to act a certain way and talk a certain way and look a certain way because there are a lot of stereotypes surrounding black people. And if they don't do that, then they'll seem violent or aggressive towards the white students and the teachers. And because of this, there are a lot of microaggressions and racism that goes on and a microaggression is an indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group. And they have to just kind of let it slide because the teachers and nobody else is going to stick up for them. And if they speak, they will get in trouble for something that they didn't do. And an example of this is when an 11 year old went to a suburban school where he managed to avoid getting in trouble. He was a good student, in lots of advanced classes but there was still racism and a white student in his class said that black people come from the jungle that they commit the majority of crimes and that the world would be better off without them now the teacher heard all of this but still did nothing this happens a lot where the teachers will hear or hear um, racism and microaggressions but still do nothing about it and there are no black teachers to tell um, the students to like to tell the students that they shouldn't say that. And in many of these suburban schools, the uh, history surrounding African Americans is also very sugar-coated. So Af um, students go not knowing. We have a caller, actually. We have a caller, actually. Um, can you repeat what you said to, to us? Mm -hmm. Say it again. Can you repeat what you said to us? I said, my name is Tina Lee. I'm a church member at GMCC, currently living in New York State. And I just wanted to say what a good job you guys are doing, and I really appreciate it. So have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank, so thank, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, well, I was saying how teachers, um, they do this a lot, where they will just let microaggressions and racism slide um, when it's towards a black student because there's no – because well, they don't really understand and they just will tell the student to just get over it, over it or live with it and the person can't really do anything about it because then they'll end up getting in trouble for something that someone else did to them. And in these schools, there are also larger budgets because Boston Public and public schools, they receive like a lack of funding. So there are a lot of bigger budgets, which is more resources. So the kids can get a better education, but at the same time, there's lack of diversity and they can't connect with their teachers or their peers without having to act a certain way. And then people will say like, oh, you act white or you talk white. And that just like will make people feel uncomfortable. Now, MECO is still an amazing program that you should really sign up for. It's just MECO is a lottery. So basically you are you are um, putting your name in and you have to try to get in. And if you do, then you'll be very lucky and you'll be able to go into a program where you can go to a school that you will get a great education. Currently, 
79.99% of African American students. Ask you again, but we have another caller. Um, can you? Hi. Hi. So I appreciate you know your your um your broadcast today, but I just want to say that I'm a Meco director in a district, and um, I have to disagree on some level. Um, it's the Meco department's job to address these issues of racism and microaggressions. They do happen, but um, I, I would have to disagree to say that, you know, nothing is said or done. Um, and most of the Meco districts have a commitment to diversify. I think, though, it's important that parents help their children understand why they've chosen to put their kids in um, these school districts, as well as challenging the districts to provide professional development for staff to address the issues of microaggressions and bias, and to challenge um, the staff to understand how culture and race play into education and that role. So I just want to say that I um, appreciate your, your research and your opinion, um, but it, it is our job, and I know it myself and my department, we work very hard to ensure that um, equity is taking place and that when microaggressions happen that we're educating people um, around those and um, to really help the district grow. It's not enough to just send our children out here. We have to be involved in the schools and in the um, education of our children so thank you thank you well that wasn't research i actually was a meco student and that actually happened to me many times but there they did speak and there were some like meetings where they would have all the students come in and they would talk to us all like the whole school about this racism and everything going on but I mean, it still did happen, and um, yeah, uh, but currently, studies have shown that 79.99% of African American students graduated high school on time in four years in Massachusetts, compared to 92.7% of white students in Massachusetts that graduated on time, and so that just shows the difference and the the gap between the African American students and the white students and how they're receiving there's better resources for them than there some is for us a lot of the time. And once again you are listening to WBPG LPFM Boston Praise Radio and you can call in at 617-282-0685. Yes, so we actually have just under 2 minutes left. Uh, so we'll be closing soon. And um, I just wanted to quickly say I I went to a, I wasn't a part of the Metco program, but I went to a school that had it. And it was just really shocking to see like one, one of the, the Metco kids have actually stated like, oh, um, hello out of the 2,600 kids in this school, there are only 150 African-American students. And that just really, I don't know why, that just really shocked me. I always thought that there, were, there was more and stuff. But again, we do have to um, end soon. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, but again, you are listening to WPPG. LP 102.9 FM radio. This is the Academy of Broadcasting second broadcast. And please join us again next Tuesday at 11 a.m.